All right, first updates on Gaza conflict. Delegations from Israel and Hamas are scheduled to hold talks in Cairo on Sunday in the hopes of reviving stalled ceasefire talks. This comes as the Israeli government is under increased international and domestic pressure to reach a deal with Hamas to release hostages being held in Gaza. U.S. CIA Director Bill Burns already arrived in Cairo on Saturday to attend talks. Qatari Foreign Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani and an Israeli delegation are expected to take part in the talks as well. And according to reports, the Israeli military has withdrawn all ground troops from the southern Gaza Strip except for one brigade. Israel launched airstrikes on eastern Lebanon early on Sunday, hitting what it said were Hezbollah infrastructure sites after the armed group downed an Israeli drone over the country. Both sides continue to trade fire amid escalating regional tensions. The Israeli army in a statement said that fighter jets struck a military complex and three other infrastructure sites belonging to Hezbollah in the eastern city of Baalbek. It said the latest attack was in response to Hezbollah's downing of an unmanned aerial vehicle in Lebanese airspace, which the group identifies as the Israeli-made Hermes 900 drone. Hezbollah has been trading fire with Israel across Lebanon's southern border since October 8. Now, Israel's army on Saturday released footage it said showed the targeting and destruction of tunnels operated by Hamas in the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunis. The army, in a statement accompanying the video, said that the tunnels had been uncovered in the past with one dating back a decade. In addition to the three tunnel-like structures, the Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, claimed that the Hamas-run excavation workshop was also destroyed. All right, India correspondent Sarah Coates joins us from Tel Aviv for more. Sarah, uh, what's the latest update, first of all, you're getting for us as far as the true stocks are concerned? Yes, hello, Sid. Well, these talks are expected to begin in the next few hours. We do know that the head of the CIA, Bill Burns, is there. Also, the Qatari Prime Minister, Egypt's spy chief. And we are expecting an Israeli delegation, as long with the dele along with the delegation, rather, from Hamas to be there in Cairo. But at this hour, really, there is little indication that either side, Israel or Hamas, would be willing to budge on the end of the war. We do know that Hamas wants a full comprehensive ceasefire. This mm. is certainly something that Israel says it will not agree to, given that it believes the last four or so Hamas battalions are stationed down into that southern Gazan city of Rafah, which is an area that Israel says it's adamant to get into to defeat Hamas. But of course, these next few hours, these next few days will certainly be very telling. Israel is under a lot of pressure to make some sort of a compromise here. We saw massive demonstrations in Tel Aviv overnight, tens of thousands of people taking part, urging the Prime Minister to come to a deal with Hamas to free these remaining 134 hostages from Gaza. And people also calling on the Prime Minister to step down, saying that elections need to be held now. So as I mentioned, uh, not a lot of hope with regards to these talks, but at the same time, a lot of pressure on the government, Sid. Well, a lot of things happening there. Now, Sarah, the reports are coming in that the IDF is withdrawing all ground troops from southern Gaza Strip. What is this indicating? Well, this could signal that the IDF is moving away, excuse me, <clears throat> from these large-scale operations and may now focus on more targeted raids in that southern area. We do still know that troops are operating in the north, but of course what it could also signal is that potentially more of these troops are being moved out of Gaza and may potentially be moved to the northern part of the country given these tit-for-tat skirmishes with Hezbollah are only intensifying. And then of course there is this major threat coming from Iran in the wake of that strike in Syria which killed a number of senior Iranian officials. There's a lot of tension here on the ground uh, amid reports from Iran that it is planning on retaliating to Israel. We heard from one of these senior Iranians saying uh, that the US should not get involved but as I said a lot of concern uh, we do know that reservist troops they've had their leave cancelled more reservists have even been called up the aerial defenses here in Israel they have been bolstered and GPS signals 
continue to be jammed. So certainly a lot of concern about this retaliatory strike, when and how it may take place. And people here on the ground have been uh, panic buying things like groceries, buying generators and taking out cash over fear of a reprisal from Iran. Sid. All right, believe that. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining in and for your analysis. The Joint Operations Command of the Ministry of Defence announced the implementation of 26th airdrop of humanitarian and relief aid as part of the Birds of Goodness operation. The United Arab Emirates Ministry of Defence released footage on Saturday, reportedly showing its air forces dropping humanitarian aid parcels into northern Gaza in a joint effort with Egypt. Two UAE C-17 aircraft and two Egyptian C-295 aircraft participated in the airdrop operation. Over 80 tons of food and relief aid and supplies were dropped over isolated areas in northern Gaza. Now, as part of an international effort to help set up a new humanitarian maritime corridor, a British Royal Navy ship will supply aid to Gaza. The multinational effort involving the United States, Cyprus and other partners will develop a new temporary pier off the coast of Gaza. British Foreign Minister David Cameron pledged $12.26 million for aid equipment and logistical expertise to help set up the maritime corridor from Cyprus to Gaza. The initiative will see aid pre-screened in Cyprus and delivered directly to Gaza. Through the new U.S. temporary pier being constructed off the coast or via Ashdod port after Israel agreed to open it. Well, it's been six months since Hamas fighters broke through from Gaza into Israel on 7th of October, killing about 1,200 people and taking hundreds hostage. UN Chief Antonio Guterres once again condemned the attack and called for the unconditional release of all the hostages. The 7th of October is a day of pain for Israel and the world. The United Nations and I personally mourn with Israelis for the 1,200 people including many women and children, were killed in cold blood. Nothing can justify the horror unleashed by Hamas in October 7th. And I once again utterly condemn the use of sexual violence, torture, injuring and kidnapping of civilians, the firing of rockets towards civilian targets, and the use of human shields. And I call for the unconditional release of all the hostages still held by Hamas and other armed groups. Now the United States says it's preparing for a possible Iranian attack in Israel or the region. U.S. officials are warning it could come in retaliation to Israel striking the Iranian embassy in Syria. DD India's Nick Harper sends this report from Washington. High alert. There is significant concern that there will be an attack within the coming days. U.S. officials say they believe an attack is now inevitable and they think that attack will be significant, uh, saying we are definitely at a high state of vigilance. Now, they're not sure or at least not saying where that attack could take place. But the potential, they say, is either within Israel itself or against American targets within the region. Uh, all of this coming off the back of an Israeli airstrike, not confirmed by the Israelis, but the thinking is that they carried it out on Monday in Damascus on Iran's embassy. One of the top Iranian commanders were killed. Iran also saying that another seven people were killed during that attack. Now, obviously, that created a major escalation in terms of relations between Israel and Iran. And the fear is that after a couple of months of uh, significant calm within the region, there could be this potential of a flare up. We've seen, obviously, the Israel Hamas conflict continue. But when it comes to other Iran backed actors in the region, Hezbollah and also the Houthis in Yemen, it has been somewhat quieter during recent weeks. So concern now from U.S. officials, enough concern that the U.S. President Joe Biden, when he spoke to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday, did discuss this and discuss the possibility of it taking place. 
and how uh, they would potentially deal with the fallout from it. Because it's now a case of if we were to see this attack, how would the US and Israel respond? Concern that this could create a significant problem within the region, could create a significant escalation in tensions between Iran, Israel and the US. In Washington, Nick Harper reporting for DD India. Russia and Ukraine waged a tug of war in attacking each other's military targets. Russia on Saturday attacked Ukrainian military industrial enterprises while Ukraine hit Russian military targets. The Russian Ministry of Defense reported on Saturday that the Russian army utilized long-range precision-guided munition and drones to attack on Ukrainian facilities. The general staff of Ukrainian armed forces reported that it conducted strikes on 14 locations where Russian air defense system was stationed. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky hopes that he and Swiss counterpart would set a date for World Peace Summit in Switzerland, which 80 to 100 countries are expected to participate. Russia has said such a meeting would be pointless if it did not participate. Kyiv has previously proposed a World Peace Summit but said Russia would not be invited. Zelensky said in a television interview that he and the Swiss president would have to agree on the date between them and then send invitations to the world leaders. While well, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will be on a two-day visit to China on Monday and Tuesday. Lavrov will discuss the Russia-Ukraine conflict and deepening partnership between Moscow and Beijing with Chinese counterpart Wang Yi. News from Mexico now. Mexico has suspended diplomatic ties with Ecuador after police raided its embassy in Quito to arrest former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. Nicaragua has also joined Mexico in cutting all diplomatic relations with Ecuador as a flagrant violation of international law. Glass had been holed up in the embassy in Quito since seeking political asylum in December. He has been accused by Ecuadorian authorities of embezzling government funds meant to help rebuild after a devastating 2016 earthquake. He has now been flown under police guard to the city of Guayaquil and is expected to await trial in a maximum security prison. Meanwhile, Glass says he is the subject of political persecution and had been sheltering inside the embassy. Glass served as Ecuador's vice president between 2013 and 2017. He was relieved of his duties because of mounting corruption allegations against him. Later that year, he was sentenced to six years in jail in connection with corruption at the Brazilian construction giant Odebrecht. Meanwhile, citizens in the streets of Quito and Mexico City expressed disappointment with the diplomatic problems that have escalated between their governments over the last few days. Mexicans mostly disapproved of the reaction of Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador, arguing he wasn't complying with Mexico's non-interventionist foreign policy with his actions. Arrest of Ecuador's former Vice President Glass sparked outrage in the Mexico City, which suspended relations with Quito. News from the United States, former U.S. President and Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump appeared at a fundraising event in Palm Beach, Florida on Saturday. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's campaign made a major fundraiser in Florida, raked in a massive $50.5 million. After arriving at the event, Trump promised that change would come very quickly once he regained the presidency. The event slated to be his biggest fundraiser yet is a much needed opportunity for Trump, who has been routinely outraised by Biden and is in the midst of a financial squeeze due to ballooning lawyer fees and legal payouts. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden's re-election campaign raised over $187 million in the first quarter 2024, almost double what it took in during the previous quarter. In Slovakia, Peter Pellegrini wins the presidential election, defeating Ivan Korchok. Peter Pellegrini received 56.7 of the vote in Saturday's runoff election, topping former Foreign Minister Ivan Korchok, who had 43.3%. This election result propels Pellegrini to be Slovakia's sixth president since its independence from Czechoslovakia in 1993. The outgoing president, Zuzana Chaputova, known for her support of Ukraine amidst Russian aggression, chose not to seek re-election for the largely ceremonial role. Although Slovak presidents wield limited executive powers, they can veto laws or challenge them in the constitutional court. They also nominate constitutional court judges, potentially shaping political conflicts over FICO's reforms, which aim to reduce penalties for corruption. 
and still to come on DD India News R. 30th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide is being observed today. More details ahead. People in Paris ditch their coats and jackets as temperatures are set to reach higher. A total solar eclipse is set to occur on 8th of April. We'll tell you more details. Stay tuned. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs. With a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. You're watching DD India News R. I'm Siddharth Paradwaj. 30th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide is being observed today. The genocidal activities commenced after the assassination of the president of Rwanda. Over 800,000 members of minority Tutsi community were killed in the Rwandan genocide that occurred from April 7 to July 15, 1994. India's Secretary of the Ministry of External Affairs, Economic Relations, Damu Ravi, represented the government of India at the event, marking the 30th commemoration of the Rwanda genocide. India's MEA Secretary, Economic Relations, is on a three-nation visit of Rwanda, Uganda and Kenya from April 7 to 12. As part of the week-long national mourning, Rwanda will observe solemn events with flags flown at half-mast and restrictions on public activities like music, sports, events and movies. The United Nations and the African Union will also pay tribute to the victims of the genocide. Rwandan President Paul Kagame and his wife lit the Rwandan genocide flame of hope known as the Kwebuka as the commemoration of the 1994 genocide began in Kigali on Sunday. Kagame was joined by current and former leaders including former US President Bill Clinton and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. The trauma of the genocide has left deep scars on Rwandan society prompting ongoing efforts for reconciliation and justice. This was indeed a very tragic day in 1994, Rwanda genocide. The world remembers this day. All the leaders gather to commemorate Rwanda 1994 genocide. We will soon be joined by a correspondent in Kampala for more details on this. It's the 30th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide which is being observed today. The genocidal activities commenced after the assassination of the president of Rwanda. Over 800,000 members of minority Tutsi community were killed in the Rwandan genocide that occurred from April 7 to July 15, 1994. For more details on this, we will shortly be joined by our correspondent who is there in Kimpala. Indeed, a tragic day in the history books in 1994. And the 38th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide, which is being observed today. India's Secretary of the Ministry of External Affairs, Economic Relations, Damu Ravi, represented the government of India at the event. All right, and Deed India correspondent Leon Senyake joins us from Kampala on this. Leon, indeed a tragic day. In the history books in 1994 whatever happened the world remembers it the world remembers the rwanda genocide now can you provide some context on the factors leading up to the rwandan genocide for those who may not be familiar with the history
Well, yes, uh, definitely. 7th April is a very important day in, uh, the, in Rwanda, but uh, the turbulent times of Rwanda don't just start in 1994 uh, with great history of uh, the suppression of the minority tribe, uh, which was uh, the Tutsi by the Hutus. But around 1970, with uh, the presidency or the leadership of uh, Juvenal Habyarimana, then uh, there was uh, indeed uh, a push on uh, the suppression or uh, the push on uh, the anti uh, Hutu sentiments and also also pro Tutsi sentiments that escalated quite uh, uh, extensively until about 1994 actually mm. 6th April 1994 when uh, President Juvenal Habyarimana's plane was gunned down that was his assassination um, uh, the Hutus then uh, 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 the Hutus then accused the Tutsi rebels for that particular attack and on mm. the 7th of April sparked a mm. um, hundred days of, of what was a devastating um, a situation in Rwanda more than um, close, close to one million people there in being uh, killed in, in the genocide in which uh, the Hutu pro-government and also a militia group called the Intarahamwe um, uh, of course turned on to the Tutsis. Uh, and it was indeed very devastating that neighbors turned on to neighbors, uh, families against families, friends against friends. And uh, this of course was uh, such a devastating uh, situation in Rwanda. It took approximately 100 days to bring an end to, to the genocide uh, despite uh, the challenges that uh, happened therein. And of course on 4th July coming to an end with uh, the Rwanda Patriotic Force then led by uh, the current president uh, Paul Kagame storming into uh, the capital Chigali there and, uh, and uh, kicking out uh, the uh, Hutu government uh, forces and of course putting calm to uh, the situation that caused much devastation. So uh, briefly that is uh, the extreme of what uh, the genocide was. It however is uh, one kind of history that the Rwandans have uh, quickly or attempting to quickly put behind. Uh, Leon, now, in what ways has Rwanda worked to reconcile and heal from the trauma of the genocide in the years since? Well, there's indeed been great work put in. Uh, the post-genocide government, of course, has uh, put uh, much effort in trying to push the agenda of unity and reconciliation. In the early days there in uh, the national courts, at least by 2006, had tried about 10,000 genocide suspects. There were the national um, uh, tribunals at, at the national level, the grassroots level, which was the, called the gachachas. Uh, very prominent there in, in trying to raise the levels of reconciliation between uh, those that were suspected genocide uh, attackers or conscriptors or uh, omitters therein against the people that uh, they felt uh, would not have, uh, could bear this kind of situation. So it has been a gradual process of arrival at justice, which uh, for many feel, uh, feel should have been or is. Uh, the first part of trying to raise reconciliation and progressively Rwanda has tried to reconstruct its identity, uh, the gospel of uh, being one people therein and of course that raises the issue of uh, the commemoration of um, uh, the never again a slogan uh, in Rwanda, the Kwebuka event that is going on today on the 7th of April, which is a commemoration of, uh, of, of the events of 1994. But uh, of course, uh, simultaneously now, 30 years down the road, you can tell that um, uh, there's been quite a great effort in trying to put Rwandans back together at uh, the unity of uh, one nation and the, uh, the sentiments therein of the discrimination or xenophobic uh, sentiments are not existing. Uh, but even still, there's still a lot of work for the government to do going forward for the generations to come, for there are still many people that uh, still feel hurt or uh, pained by the events of 1994. All right, for now, Leon, we leave it there, but thank you so much for your analysis. Police authorities in Nigeria says they've deployed personnel to restore peace in Omala, local government area in the country's north-central state of Kogi. This follows the killing of over 20 people in the region by gunmen. Did India's Tessa McCandy reports. Police public relations officer in the state, William Aya, while confirming the incidents as the gunmen also set houses ablaze. 
Locals say most of the casualties were old people who could not run for safety. Several other people were injured, while many have left the communities for safety. Local authorities said the incident on Thursday was a reprisal attack by herders against farmers who earlier killed six of them over Joseph land. It's led to this deployment of security personnel to attempt to restore and maintain peace. Conflict between farmers and herders are common in Nigeria, especially in Kogi and other parts of the north central region, where the land is arable and also good for pasture. The country's House of Representatives says the situation has led to the loss of over 60,000 lives. The government says it is introducing improved agricultural practices, such as ranching, as part of measures to address the situation. Some states have already abolished the open grazing system and given room for the establishment of the ranches. Tassim Akende in Jos, reporting for DD India. And a total solar eclipse is set to occur on 8th of April. The celestial phenomenon where the moon completely obscures the sun, casting a shadow on Earth, will move across Mexico, the United States and Canada, but will not be visible from the Indian subcontinent. The eclipse is set to commence over the South Pacific Ocean, with the first point of contact on continental North America being Mexico's Pacific coast at approximately 11.07 a.m. So many changes will occur during this solar eclipse. This will be a total solar eclipse and would be a memorable event as it's going to occur after 54 years. Well, some weather news now. People in Paris ditch their coats and jackets as temperatures are set to reach higher in April. The weather authorities warns the temperatures to mount and reach up to 30 degrees Celsius in the south of France. Experts claim the warmer weather is due to warm air masses continuing to circulate over much of Europe. France to break the record of warmest April this month. And in Australia, thousands of more residents have been evacuated while others have been warned to prepare to leave following a mammoth downpour in New South Wales over the weekend. More than 100 flood warnings remained in place for towns along the Hawkesbury and Nepean rivers on Sunday morning after Friday's deluge. Thousands of residents across Sydney's west and northwest have been evacuated while over 140 people were saved from flood waters since Saturday morning. Water levels are expected to peak on Sunday before subsiding after clouds parted over the weekend with a little rain predicted to fall until Tuesday. The NSW government on Sunday announced a disaster recovery package for over a dozen communities affected by flooding. Now, markets in Indonesia's capital Jakarta were bustling as the world's second largest Muslim population prepared for Eid al-Fitr festivities. Indonesian Muslims will usher in the Eid festival on Thursday. Locals were seen rushing to shops to buy food, snacks and clothing for the celebrations which mark the holy fasting month of Ramadan. And still to come on DD India News Hour. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses huge public rallies in India's eastern state of Bihar and West Bengal as campaigning in India's general election is picking up pace. And we'll also tell you how the temple festival was celebrated in South Indian state of Kerala. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024 the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. You're watching DD India News R. I'm Siddharth Bhardwaj. A quick recap of the headlines. Delegations from Israel and Hamas head to Cairo for Gaza talk ceasefire on agenda as conflict enters seventh month. Mexico suspends diplomatic ties with Ecuador, move after police raided its embassy in Quito to arrest former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. 
Campaigning in full swing for the first phase of India's general elections, India's PM Modi addresses mega rallies in eastern state of Bihar and West Bengal. And in Indian Premier League, Delhi Capitals win the toss and opt to bowl against Mumbai Indians. All eyes on Surya Kumar Yadav as he returns to Mumbai Indians squad after a prolonged injury. All right, let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Campaigning in India's general election is in full swing. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed a huge public meeting in Nevada in India's state of Bihar. Saluting the land of Magadh, the Prime Minister said that what he guaranteed ahead of the previous elections, he stood by his promises. जो भारत को आंख दिखाते थे अब वो आटे के लिए भटक रहे हैं मोदी ने गारंटी दी थी कि अयोध्या में राम लला का भव्य मंदिर बनेगा आज अयोध्या में भव्य राम मंदिर का शिखर आसमान छू रहा है जो 500 वर्षों में नहीं हो पाया जिस राम मंदिर के निर्माण को रोकने की कांग्रेस और आरजेडी ने बरसों तक कोशिश की वो राम मंदिर बनकर तैयार हो गया पीएम मोदी एड्रेस्ड अनदर पब्लिक मीटिंग इन जलपाईगुड़ी इन इंडिया ईस्टर्न स्टेट ऑफ वेस्ट बंगाल ही वॉज फेलिसिटेटेड बाय द पार्टी मेंबर्स and pm modi's next event will be in the central state of madhya pradesh where he will lead a road show in jabalpur and bjp national president jp nadda addressed a public meeting in chidambaram a town in the southern state of tamil nadu nadda stated that india has taken a significant leap in the development and has become the fifth largest economy in the world surpassing britain he further mentioned that the indian economy will become the third largest economy in the world during the third term of dynamic pm narendra modi india's defense minister and senior bjp leader rajnath singh addressed a public rally in rajasthan's bikaner on sunday the minister urged the public to vote for the bjp for development He also highlighted that the BJP abolished the practice of triple talaq to empower Muslim women in the country. The Communist Party of India released its manifesto for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections on Saturday. CPI General Secretary D Raja along with senior leaders released the manifesto in New Delhi. While releasing manifesto, D Raja said CPI will form the government with left, progressive and democratic forces and will work to ensure decent minimum wages to all laborers. He added that the party would seek increased funding to create health and education infrastructure which is accessible to all. All right, let's go across to DD India's Dibyendu Mondal. Dibyendu, uh, could you give us more details on the CPIM election manifesto which they have released? Uh, well, so that the CPIM released its election manifesto yesterday, and uh, remember they are the uh, part of the larger India Alliance or the Alliance of the Opposition Party. Mm. Uh, before we get into the details of the manifesto of the CPIM, let us also inform our viewers that the CPIM is just limited to uh, three states, where uh, in uh, they are in power, of course, in Kerala, in other two states, which is uh, the uh, the state of West Bengal and Tripura. uh they are not even in opposition but however having said that uh, the cpim's uh, election manifesto uh, talks about uh, several several issues that the left party is wants to highlight uh, some including the decentralization of the education system they also talks about uh, the deprivatization of the public sector undertakings uh, that uh, had been done in the past and they have also promised in their election manifesto that they will not let the decentralization of any other public sector under, uh, undertaking 
happen in the country if they are elected to power uh, it has also spoken about independence of uh, the the uh, investigative agencies such as the cbi and the enforcement directorate and the income tax uh, department uh, they have also uh, uh, they have also promised in their election manifesto to uh, to give jobs to the unemployed youth of the country and if the party if elected to power are not able to give uh, jobs to the uh, uh, to the unemployed youth of the country it has guaranteed a minimum financial assistance to all the unemployed youth of the country uh, it also speaks about abolishing the post of governor from the state uh, it also further speaks about giving more rights to the states mm -hmm. also st uh, speaks about uh, you know uh, in fact it promises that education uh, will be brought under the, uh, under the state list uh, which is currently under the concurrent list uh, in the constitution of india uh it also speaks about you know increasing wages for the manrega workers from uh, the current uh, 400 to 600 rupees uh the the congress uh, i beg i beg your pardon the cpi manifesto also speaks about uh you know the decentralization of powers from the central government uh, it also uh, talks about uh, you know uh, the equality in terms of giving jobs to every gender uh, uh, including the lgbtq community so these are some of the key highlights of uh, the manifesto of the left parties that was uh, uh, that was released uh, yesterday by this uh, top leadership of the communist party of india yes back to you sudar all right uh, dibendu let's talk about the bjp and south india <clears throat> now bjp national president jp nadda is touring south india and bjp does not have much presence in the southern india what do you think this time around would be bjp's position in uh, south india Uh, well siddharth uh, you know if we talk about southern india the bjp has been trying to make some inroads uh, into uh, most parts of south india which is currently aloof uh, from the bjp's political agenda as well as from the bjp's political footprint in those states uh, but having said this you know the bjp had been trying for a very long time to get into uh, the politics of kerala but however it has not been successful till now hmm. uh, but in in the recent uh, in the recent years the bjp also noticed that uh, you know tamil nadu has been a fertile ground uh, is in fact being a fertile ground for the saffron party to make its uh, entry into the southern indian politics uh, and uh, which the bjp has been successfully able to uh, you know cultivate is what uh, many political experts uh, from southern india say that the bjp could make significant uh, uh, gains in the political spectrum in the coming election especially with regards to the state of uh, tamil nadu uh, 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 you would also uh, notice siddharth you know the prime minister had been extensively campaigning in tamil nadu yeah. uh, he had uh, even before the elections was announced uh, the prime minister had towards several parts of uh, tamil nadu Uh, uh, you, uh the the national president of the bjp jp nadda is currently also on a on a two day in fact uh, yeah on a two day visit to uh, the south indian states uh, he was in kerala yesterday and he will be visiting multiple parts of uh, tamil nadu today and tomorrow so uh, you know the bjp's push uh for for the state of tamil nadu and uh, to gain some uh, vote uh, votes in the southern part of india is of course being seen by uh, the focus of the top leadership of the bjp but having said this you know uh, how much it will translate into electoral uh, benefits for the bjp is something that of course we'll have to wait and watch but what is for certain is that uh, if uh, if if we uh, i mean if, if we can discount the number of seats that the bjp could perhaps win from south india but what is definite is that what many many political observers say is that the bjp is going to increase its vote share in 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 several parts of south india given the fact that it has been pushing itself uh, hard to get into the south indian politics and uh, become an acceptable party uh, to to the many uh, thousands of people in south india yes back to you well certainly the bindu election fervor is gripping the country we live there thank you so much for joining in and thank you so much for your analysis the bindu Uddhav Thackeray's campaign got a fresh setback ahead of the Lok Sabha elections as former Maharashtra minister and deputy leader of the Shiv Sena UBT Babun Rao Gulab joined the Shiv Sena led by Chief Minister Eknath Shinde. Gulab joined the party in the presence of Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde, State Minister Dada Bhuse and Deputy Chairperson of Maharashtra Legislative Council Neenam Gore. Shinde said two more MLAs from Rajasthan will join the party in the next two days. Gulab is a five-time MLA from Nasik district of Maharashtra. 
Congress President has approved the proposal for the formation of the Campaign Committee of the Rajasthan Pradesh Congress Committee for the General Elections 2024 with immediate effect. The All India Congress Committee on Saturday approved a 32-member campaign committee for the Lok Sabha elections in Rajasthan. Managing logistics in a country with 968 million voters is an incredible task and it will be carried out by the Election Commission of India when the country holds general elections. Our next report tells you more about the ECI's role and powers. After India became independent in 1947, the founding fathers of the Indian Republic envisaged a representative parliamentary democracy based on the universal adult franchise. Keeping in line with those ethos, the Election Commission of India was established on 25th of January 1950. The ECI is an autonomous constitutional body responsible for conducting and regulating polls. Its powers are broadly divided into three categories administrative, advisory and judicial. The administrative powers include registration of eligible voters, preparation of poll schedule depending on the availability of resources both in terms of execution and security needs, scrutinize nomination papers of candidates. The poll body's most important task is to ensure the fairness of the electoral process and prevent incidents of rigging, booth capturing and violence. Coming to advisory powers, the ECI can recommend the President and the State Governors to disqualify sitting members of Parliament and members of Legislative Assemblies respectively if they are found guilty of indulging in corrupt practices during polls. As for the judicial powers, the Election Commission cannot review any poll result on its own. This can only be done through an election petition which can be filed before the High Court. But the ECI can settle disputes related to recognition of political parties. Apart from ensuring free and fair elections, the poll body has also been organizing various awareness campaigns to increase voter turnout. Bureau Report, DD India. And ahead of India's general elections, school students in North India's Moradabad painted their face, made sand arts and portraits to motivate people for voting. The students were participating in a campaign to raise awareness among people to vote in the upcoming general elections. To inform youngsters and evoke interest in them about India's space missions, motivating them to become a part of the space industry, the Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium of India's Bengaluru is showcasing a sky show in its auditorium starting Sunday, which is produced by the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. The theme of the show revolves around Indian Space Odyssey, sounding rockets to Gaganyaan. The 30-minute show's prime highlight is its animations of the various aspects of the Gaganyaan mission and the accurate replication of the spacecraft. India's Chief of Defence Staff General Anil Chauhan will chair Maiden Parivartan Chintan, a tri-service conference on jointness and integration on Monday. Parivartan Chintan is a brainstorming and ideas incubation conference of heads of tri-services institutions of the Indian Armed Forces, the Department of Military Affairs DMA and Headquarters Integrated Defence Staff. The day-long Parivartan Chintan tri-service conference aimed at generating new and fresh ideas, initiatives and reforms to propel jointness and integration efforts. Well, in Chhattisgarh's Bijapur district bordering Telangana, three Naxalites were gunned down in an exchange of fire with security forces in a dense forest. The encounter took place in Pujari Kankar forest along the interstate border when a team of greyhounds, Telangana's elite anti-Naxal force, was out on an operation. A team of Chhattisgarh police was also present in the area to extend auxiliary support to the greyhounds team. Huge amount of arms and ammunitions also recovered from Naxals. 
Well, the Aam Aadmi Party is holding a mass fast in a collective act of solidarity against the arrest of party chief and Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal across the country. Leaders of AAP, including Sanjay Singh and Atishi, congregated at Jantar Mantar in Delhi, where they hit out at the central government. An interfaith cultural evening, Om Siat, hosted by the BAPS Hindu Temple in Abu Dhabi. Over 200 leaders and community members from diverse faiths attended the event. The event was a convergence of faith, culture and dialogue. The event was also attended by many prominent leaders of local religious communities. Head of the BAPS Hindu Mandir, Swami Brahma Vihari Das addressed the evening. The vegetarian food was served cooked by volunteers from the temple. All right, let's take a look at other stories making news. An earthquake of magnitude 4.3 on the Richter scale hit Andaman Sea during early hours on Sunday morning. Similar earthquake tremors of magnitude 3.4 were felt in Kargil, Ladakh during late hours on Saturday night. Several coaches of Vishaka Patnam Amritsar Hirakund Express train were damaged after a high speed car broke the closed railway crossings and rammed into the train in Anuppur in central state of Madhya Pradesh. According to reports, one man has lost his life in the incident. Kaziranga National Park and Tiger Reserve in India's northeastern state of Assam also saw an increase in footfall. Summers are here and people are flocking to scenic areas for a time off. Amid the rising temperatures in the plain areas of India, people from different states flogged to India's northern state of Uttarakhand's Nainital to escape from unwavering heat where people could be seen enjoying boat rides and scenic landscapes. More than one lakh lamps were lit in Anchamukku Devi Temple, southern Indian city of Tiruvananthapuram on the occasion of uh, Ulsavam festival. This was the first time Laksha Dweepim was organized as part of the temple festival. The temple witnessed a heavy rush as devotees thronged to observe the festival and light lamps. Still to come on DD Indian News Hour. Zimbabwe introduces a new gold-backed currency called Zig. In another Indian Premier League match, Lucknow Super Giants to clash with Gujarat Titans later in the evening today. Kevin De Bruyne claims his 100th goal for the club in a comeback victory at Crystal Palace. The land of Dravidians, Tamil Nadu goes to polls in one go. How will the National Party's alliance face the political heat with the regional satraps? What are the issues that could find resonance among the voters as India decides? Will the vote share increase help the National Party's get a foothold in the minds of the people? Watch Why Tamil Nadu Matters on the Great Indian Election at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT only on TV India. You're watching DD Indian News R. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj and time now for business news. To continue discussions on economic front between the US and China, US Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen met China's Premier Li Chang to discuss economic relationship between the two countries. Both the leaders emphasized to work together and make progress directly and communicate openly. Now, the Train Drivers Union of the United Kingdom, ASLEF, has launched a new round of strikes which is expected to impact most railway services in the country. The Houston railway station was affected by the strikes. The station looked extremely deserted on Friday morning with only a few passengers. A dozen train drivers gathered outside the station holding banners and slogans to express their complaints. According to the union, train drivers under the union have not received any pay rise since April 2019 and many people have been experiencing a living cost crisis as product prices in Britain have soared due to the effects of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. This round of strikes was scheduled to be held on Friday, Saturday and Monday, impacting operations of 16 railway companies. According to Rail Delivery Group, the strikes held from June 2022 to January 2024 had caused £775 million of economic loss to the country's railway industry.
Zimbabwe has introduced a new gold back currency called ZIG. The name stands for Zimbabwe Gold. It's the latest attempt to stabilize the economy that has lurched from crisis to crisis for the past 25 years. Dean India's Isaac Lukando has more. The Central Bank of Zimbabwe says the ZIG will be structured and pegged at a market-determined exchange rate. The new currency replaces the Zimbabwean dollar, which has lost three-quarters of its value this year. March saw annual inflation reach 55%, a seven-month high. Zimbabweans have 21 days to exchange their old notes for new currency. Despite this, the U.S. dollar accounting for 85% of transactions will remain legal tender since most people are likely to continue preferring it. There is a historic mistrust of the central bank among Zimbabweans dating back to 2008 when it printed 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollar notes during uncontrollable inflation. Consequently, Zimbabwe abolished its currency and relied on foreign banknotes like the US dollar and the South African rand for many years. Experts are now questioning whether Zimbabwe has enough reserves to adequately back the currency and whether it could suffer from volatility in gold prices. Isaac Lukando in Dar es Salaam reporting for DD India. And you're watching DD India News at time now for sport. And in T20 cricket, Mumbai Indians got off to a blazing start against Delhi Capitals after the latter won the toss and elected to bowl in Mumbai today. Rohit Sharma and Ishan Kishan added 80 runs for the first wicket in seven overs before Sharma was dismissed by Aksar Patel. Mumbai Indians have made three changes in the playing 11. Surya Kumar Yadav has been included after a prolonged injury. Surya Kumar comes in for Namandhir. Mohammad Nabi replaces Dewal Brevis and Kwena Mahpaka makes way for Mario Shepard. On the other hand, Delhi Capitals have also made two changes. Jai Richardson and Lalit Yadav come in for Rasik Salam and Mitchell Marsh, respectively. Both teams are placed at the bottom of the 10-team points table. While Mumbai is at the last position after having lost all three games in this season, Delhi is at the ninth place with just one win in four games. In another Indian Premier League match, Lucknow Super Giants will clash with Gujarat Titans in Lucknow on Sunday. Both the teams have won two matches each this season. For Lucknow Super Giants, Nicholas Purin, Quinton de Kock and KL Rahul are in red hot form with bat, while Mayank Yadav, Naveen Ul Haq and Mohsin Khan are the highest wicket takers. For Gujarat Titans, Shubman Gill and Sai Sudarshan are the top scorers, while Mohit Sharma holds the purple cap at the moment with seven wickets. Both the teams have played four IPL matches against each other. Gujarat Titans have won all the matches. Three weeks have elapsed since their captivating clash in the FA Cup quarter-final. And now, perennial rivals Manchester United and Liverpool collide once more. This Sunday, they meet at the iconic Old Trafford Stadium for another showdown in the Premier League. The two fierce rivals are set to face off for the third time this season. The high-voltage encounter is another significant one of their respective campaigns. Liverpool are currently second in the Premier League standings. A point behind Arsenal, who have played one more game. And in men's hockey, India went down against Australia 2-4 in the second match of the five-match series in Perth on Sunday. India led at the half-time 2-1 despite trailing to an early goal. Drag flicks from Jugraj Singh and Harman Preet Singh put them in a good position. But in the third quarter, the Australians stormed back to score three goals. For Australia, Jeremy Hayward scored a brace while Anderson Jacob and Nathan netted one goal each. India now trailed the five-match hockey test series 0-2 after they were thrashed 5-1 in the opening match. Manchester City maintained their title challenge in ruthless fashion as incredible Kevin De Bruyne claimed his 100th goal for the club in a comeback victory at Crystal Palace. In an entertaining encounter, Palace stunned City with an early opener from Jean-Philippe Mateta before De Bruyne's wonderful finish pulled the visitors' level in the first half. City have 70 points after 31 games, while Arsenal have 71 points in 31 games. Liverpool has 70 points in 30 games. In an era marked by unprecedented challenges, the value of good health has never been more apparent. World Health Day is being observed every year on April 7. This year, the theme of the celebration is My Health, My Right. Here's a brief report. Have a look. World Health Day is being commemorated every year across the globe. 
On April 7, annually, the day is observed in order to raise awareness about global health issues and highlight the importance of well-being. The theme for the World Health Day 2024 is My Health, My Right, which focuses on the fundamental human right, access to quality healthcare, education and information. The origin of World Health Day goes back to 1948 when First Health Assembly was held by the organization where it was decided to commemorate April 7, also the founding day of the World Health Organization, as World Health Day. To celebrate this day, people from around the globe come together to promote a healthier world for everyone. It serves an important platform for raising awareness about important health issues and advocating for equitable access to healthcare worldwide. From AI-driven diagnostics and wearable health devices to remote patient monitoring, the future holds a promise for revolutionizing how we deliver emergency medical services. In today's rapidly evolving healthcare landscape, it is essential to champion patients' rights and drive innovation that puts the individual at the center of care. The day underscores the importance of primary health care facilities and availability of clean water. It also highlights the health challenges and focuses on the health facilities that should be provided to a human being. Good health and well-being are important and fundamental to leading a healthy and fulfilling life. It encompasses physical, mental and social well-being, enabling individuals to contribute positively to society. Nitendra Singh Report, DD India While well, Abba's Beyond Oravius reflected on the Swedish pop group's reach and longevity, has joined the cast and creators of Mamma Mia, the musical on stage at the end of a special 25th anniversary performance in London on Saturdays. Coincidentally, Saturday also marked 50 years since ABBA won the Eurovision Song Contest final in Brighton, United Kingdom in 1974 with the song Waterloo, bringing all them to global attention. That's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.